And welcome back again for part four. First of all, let me thank you for coming back. Let me thank you for spending the time. Your time is valuable um, in watching these videos, in learning this material, you know, and making yourself a better leader as well as a better project manager, okay? Because the fact is, this is what it all comes down to. It all comes down to our interaction with people, how we promote people, how we coach people, etc. So let's move on into the idea of ethics and leadership from part four of leading the project team. So when we talk about ethics, those can be defined as a set of moral principles and values. Now, this doesn't just mean your personal ethics. This can mean cultural ethics within an organization. So we get to see how we're supposed to act in an organization. So even though we're ethical and we hope that we would bring our ethics into the organization, if the ethics of the organization contradict ours, we're going to end up with serious challenges. And this could mean we, we leave the organization if they're doing things we don't agree with. All right. <laughs> this is where whistleblowers come in. And we make such a bad deal of whistleblowers when the fact is if things are being done that are unethical, that are going to affect people's safety, uh, that are going to p affect people's investments, we need to speak out. So ethical dilemmas arise when our personal values come into conflict. And again, this can happen amongst people. This can happen within the organization. Trevino and Nelson define ethics as the principles, norms, and standards of conduct that guide individuals and groups. And the fact is, I'm sure you know people that you know aren't very ethical. You know, whatever it is, cheat on their taxes, cheat in their relationship, whatever it can be. Culture, however, is defined as a shared, you know, as shared beliefs, assumptions, and values that we learn from a society or a group. Thus, we learn from the people we work with. We learn from people on the project team. And as it pertains to project management, a project manager is a leader who can create, maintain, and change the culture of the project organization. Meaning that just because we don't have a positive culture or we have a culture in the organization, it doesn't mean that we can't, I don't want to use the word manipulate, we can't change that culture for the project team. So if there are things being done in the organization that challenge the culture of the project team, we can build a different culture. But understand, we can also build a negative culture. A lot of times what we see in an organization is what's called siloed departments, where there's such unique cultures in each department that the departments don't play together, they don't stay together, they don't share, they don't communicate, and the overall vision, mission, and values of the organization are lost. So it all starts again with leadership at the top, building a culture for the organization and moving that into departments, into project teams, and onto the manufacturing floor or into the software that we build. So ethics versus legality. So when we talk about this, of course, if we're a publicly traded company, there's a bunch of legal stuff we have to follow. If we're a healthcare organization, we have to follow HIPAA. That's legal. Okay, we can actually be unethical within legal situations. That doesn't make it right. So here's sort of a matrix that says, okay, if it's unethical and legal, here it is right here, unethical and legal, that's not always clear. If it's ethical and legal, that's clear. And we're clear on the other side of things that are unethical and illegal. We're just not going to do them. Or we're going to understand the risk if we do. You know, if it's ethical but illegal, and of course, there are things that fall in that. Laws have been created that make things not necessarily, depending on your own ethics, ethical. But in fact, can be legal or can be illegal. <laughs> Ethical leadership talks about socialization, which is a process where people who are brought into the organization learn its culture. So, <laughs> leaders tend to be able to implement their own emotional intelligence, their own culture of self, if you will, into an organization. Okay, But people coming in at the lower levels end up having to adhere to the established culture 
until they get an opportunity to change it. And a lot of times culture is a reason people leave an organization. If the culture doesn't match theirs, their morals, their values, their mission, okay? New people learn not only, you know, how to dress appropriately, but, you know, but what behaviors are acceptable, unacceptable. Subsequently, socialization can encourage or discourage ethical behavior. So, again, who we surround ourselves with determines who we are willing to be. And that same thing plays into the organization and the culture of an organization. Okay. <clears throat> So unethical leadership, usually weak moral individuals, weak moral managers. Um, here's an example. So Al Chainsaw Al Dunlap, a successful business leader, but was known for emotionally abusing employees. Sounds like he didn't have emotional intelligence himself. Subordinates were expected to make the numbers at all cost, right? And I gave you an example in a previous thing of the the whys, right? The Japanese why theory, where we go past the initial why and we try to find five whys. I think I gave you the example of getting a new gas tank for an automobile from a alternate manufacturer. Why did we do that? Because our primary manufacturer couldn't produce them. <laughs> That's the first why. But then we get down to it. The reason we found an alternate is because we needed to produce so many cars in order to meet the numbers at all cost. But then we find the other why, which is the reason we're trying to meet numbers at all cost is because managers got a huge bonus if they met the quarterly or the yearly quotas. That's the real why. So then what happened is we got those gas tanks and they started exploding. And they created a lot of cost and a lot of damage to the organization, both as our reliability, as our quality, and then of course legally and financially. <laughs> but the real why was if we got back to the source, there's the real why. The real why was greed in getting and meeting the numbers, if you will. So there's another example. Back to our example here, he was caught lying and trying to cover up these practices, was fired at Sunbeam CEO when the company was near ruin. Paid a $500,000 settlement with the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, and can never serve as an officer of a publicly traded company again. Hypocritical leadership, so possibly the worst type of leader because he or she extols the virtues or integrity and ethical conduct, but then engages in unethical behavior themselves. So that whole, do what I say, not what I do. So we... Look at Jim Backer. Is it Backer or Baker? I think it's Baker. I don't remember. <laughs> Developed PTL Ministries in the 70s and 80s, largest religious broadcasting empire, right? Uh, took in millions of dollars by convincing people to purchase a limited number of life memberships for hotels that were part of a theme park. Only 25,000 memberships were to be sold, so it was limited. You know, get in, get now. However, 66,000 memberships were sold. An impossible number for the hotel to support. And Jim and his wife, Tammy Faye, used the money for large salaries and bonuses. So we get that idea, right? Do what I say, not what I do. This was a, this was a religious leader who was clearly not acting in their religious morals. Ethical neutral leadership. So a leader who is not a strong or weak ethical leader. Um but does not provide clear ethical guidance. So what is ethical? What are we going to do? Well, in our organization and in technology, <laughs> it simply starts with software licensing, folks. <laughs> you know, can we find ways around licensing software or putting software on computers? Not as easy as we used to, right? But we can. We can put software on one computer and allow multiple users to use it when in fact, the license says it's a per user license, which means if we have three users using the software, we need three licenses, even if it sits on a, one computer. So that's ba basic ethics. And you have to decide as an IT professional, when a company comes to you and says, you know, here's one license, put this on five computers, what are you going to do? That's the idea here. You know, do I do it and make money? Or do I refuse to do it and lose the money? 
Or is there a third alternative, which is I do it, but I communicate with them that to be in compliance, they need four licenses. Who knows? Each situation can be different and how we handle it. So there's an example for you. Go ahead and pause, read it about the board, uh, about uh, Sandy Wheel. You'll get the idea. Ethical leadership, someone who makes it clear that the bottom line results are important, but only if they are achieved in an ethical manner. So it doesn't matter what happens as the result, as long as we can look in the mirror and sleep at night. As long as we did what we needed to do ethically, it doesn't matter the result. So research suggests that when a culture is viewed as being ethical, employees tend to engage in fewer unethical behaviors. They're more committed to the organization and they're more willing to report problems to management. And that makes sense. Because when we have an organization that's not ethical and that goes against our moral values, that creates a lot of stress. People will leave the organization over it. Um, the worst thing is people will stay and change themselves to meet the organization. And that's never going to end up with a good, cooperative, excited employee. So common ethical dilemmas. So human resource situations, you know, project leaders should create a project environment where people feel safe and are appreciated. We've already talked about that. Issues can lead to ethical situations, discrimination, privacy, sexual or other types of harassment, as well as appraisals, you know, discipline, hiring, firing. Notice even appraisal is in there, okay? You know, as ethical dilemmas. Key considerations should be the fairness in terms of equity, you know, only performance counts, uh, reciprocity, uh, impartiality, etc. We need to treat people equally. It really is that simple. And if we don't, we open up the organization to liability, okay, in claims, in lawsuits, etc. So it does always come back to that whole money thing. Conflicts of interest, you know, include such things as overt or subtle bribes or kickbacks, as well as relationships that could question your impartiality. Now, here's an interesting situation. I completed my master's in China. And in China, part of their business process is bribes and gifts and kickbacks, and they do it all the time. Now, in the United States, we have laws against those things. And we have laws against those things because we realized that those things were negatively impacting organizations, so we created laws around them. Well, now here's the situation. If you're doing business in China, do you do business as China does business? Or do you do business as you do business in the United States? It all comes down to self-ethics and self-behavior. So something to keep in mind there. I want to give you an example of this. <laughs> when I took a class as part of my master's in business administration on ethics and leadership, we were asked what we thought the class was going to focus on. And I said, well, it's going to focus a ton on, on leadership because you can't teach ethics. And the fact is, I still believe that you cannot teach ethics, but you can remind people of ethical behavior. And if you're demonstrating ethical behavior in your organization, as a previously um, detailed slide said, you're going to get that same behavior. Your employees are going to parallel the ethical behavior and culture of the organization. And that works. <laughs> okay. So... I was asked to consider a situation where I was the leader of the company, where I could cook the books, if you would. And by cooking the books for 30 days, knowing that we had a major contract coming in, I wasn't going to have to lay off 5,000 people nationwide. Because I knew a contract was coming in the next 30 to 90 days that was going to keep those people at work. But the question is, what did I do? Did I lay off those people and not cook the books so that investors could see the reality of the situation? Or did I cook the books, keep 5,000 people and families employed and wait for the contract? And the fact is that's what we were asked to write a paper on. And I simply wrote the paper to say, I can't honestly today tell you what I would do. I'm not in that situation. I'm not looking at 5,000 
people who have family wage jobs with my organization that are about to lose their jobs when the fact is I know a contract's coming. Maybe I'd even guaranteed that it's coming. I don't know what I would do until I'm sitting behind that desk. And that for me was the honest truth. Now I did go into brief detail of what I think I would want to do, but the realization is until I'm in that situation, I don't know what I would do. Because would it really be that ethical or unethical to keep 5,000 families employed? It's just something to think about. So conflicts of interest, you know, trust is a key factor in personal and business relationships. And conflicts of interest can weaken trust if special favors are extended to only a few people. So again, treat others fairly, treat them equally. This is a great place to stop. We will finish with a last video. Should be a short one. I'll see you back then. Take care.